Greetings, gentlemen. Today I want to talk about the deadly mistake of using clever theories to explain and predict the behavior of women. Let's say a man is thinking about inviting a particular woman into his life. Maybe he's known her for a few months and he's considering moving in with her. It's far too early and it's a common mistake. He's putting a lot on the line because he doesn't know how she will act in the future. He wants to know if he can trust her, but he doesn't really know her yet. This is where it gets tempting to lean on clever theories about women so he'll have the illusion that he knows what to expect from her. He's probably been hearing theories about women his entire life, and he's probably come up with a few of his own. So before he makes what might be the biggest blunder of his life, he'll measure her against some theory and say something like, she checks all the boxes. He's setting himself up for disaster. He's not doing her any favors either. And unfortunately, this is a sort of travesty men play on themselves every day. Now let me stop here and say that it's absolutely vital to have some general theories about the opposite sex so you're not wandering aimlessly toward the nearest train wreck. But theories can be dangerously misleading when you use them to explain and predict the behavior of any particular individual. That's where your theory can actually cloud your vision rather than clarify it. There's a better way to manage this kind of uncertainty. I'll get to all that and a lot more, but before I talk about theories done wrong, let's talk about theories done right. People notice patterns and build theories about all kinds of things because doing so generally advances our survival. For example, let's say a buddy of mine eats a can of expired salmon and he ends up in the hospital. And let's say it's never occurred to me that that sort of thing could happen. It's only reasonable for me to adopt a theory about expired salmon, something to do with bacteria or parasites or rusty cans, or maybe I just decide all salmon are like that. That theory might save my life because it's good at reducing uncertainty and detecting a specific kind of danger. And there's a really important thing to know about this kind of theorizing. It doesn't matter if my theory is wrong. It doesn't even matter if the salmon wasn't what made him sick. There's no cost to being wrong because there's no cost to avoiding any particular can of salmon. Keep that in mind. It's a strength and a weakness in human cognition. I'm going to come back to it later. Theories are great for problems that have one or two variables. The problem is that when we start adding variables, things get impossibly complex and outcomes become impossible to predict. Cans of salmon are simple, but people are massively complex multivariate creatures who will bring your theory to its knees, and your theory might take you down in the process. Let's look at a case study and do a little thought experiment. This is a story of an anonymous woman who sent a question about her love life to the advice columnist at Slate. It's an interesting situation with lots of unknowns and ambiguity, just like every stranger you meet. For this experiment, I'll read her question and we'll apply some theories to see if we can make sense of her story. Any theoretical framework can reduce uncertainty, but will it get us any closer to understanding what actually makes her tick? We'll see. The question was submitted by a woman who goes by the pseudonym Too Sexy, and she wanted Slate's advice givers to answer the question, why do average looking men think they have a chance with me? She describes herself as an attractive and intelligent woman in her mid-thirties. She says she's a successful model, she has a master's degree, an above average IQ, and she's sexually unrestrained, but she has a problem. She says, the men who flock to me, asking me out to the tune of several times a week, are average or below average looking smart guys. She says this is making her feel bad. She wrote, This non-stop attention from average looking guys has started to eat away at my self-esteem. Instead of feeling flattered that they connect with me intellectually, I question whether interest from only this type of man means I'm actually not attractive. Now I should stop here and say, I smell a troll. I think Too Sexy is about as real as Barney Rubble. But I like this case study. It's provocative enough to fire up the imagination, and just like a real person, there's so much we don't know about her that it's easy to fill in the blanks with clever theories about what makes her tick. And that's exactly what the people who commented on the article did. They had theories. Most of the explanations had to do with her overvaluing herself. There were also plenty of suggestions that she hasn't come to terms with her age, and that men are interested in younger women. One commenter speculated that Too Sexy has been poisoned by feminism. Another introduced us to his theory called the Circle of Hotness, and this unfortunate soul interpreted her problem through the lens of his own regret at having lived the single life. He wrote, There is nothing at the end but the slow decay into senescence, aging partners, and declining prospects. Forget all your dreams of a cavalcade of lovers, for in the grim darkness of the midterm future, there is only death. And Timmy weighed in with, I am look for love. You might not find the deepest level of analysis over at Slate, but the point is that it's human nature to fall back on theoretical frameworks that give automatic explanations for ambiguous behavior. So getting back to the thought experiment, which I'll call How Well Do You Know Miss Sexy Pants, let's say you meet someone like her in real life. You find her intriguing, but she presents contradictions and ambiguity. You have questions like, what do you do with someone who's hot, which is a high value quality, but arrogant, which is low value? Why does she boast about herself in one breath and then say her self-esteem is suffering in the next? And if she really has an above average IQ, why is she going to Slate for advice? People are chock full of mysteries and contradictions, and if your mind functions normally, it will get busy trying to fill in the blanks. 
you'll probably turn to a theoretical framework that has worked for you in the past, and you don't have to invent your own. You can use any existing theory that you find compelling. Let's look at a few examples. For starters, maybe you see things through the lens of pathology and diagnosis, like a lot of psychologists do. You notice her lack of empathy, her arrogance, her belief that she should only associate with high-status people. This theory says she needs treatment for her narcissistic personality. Or maybe you're into attachment theory. You notice she's isolated and rejecting those who try to connect with her. This theory says she's a clear case of dismissive avoidant attachment style. She needs to develop her social skills and learn to express herself. Or maybe for you it's all about hypergamy. I don't think there's ever been a better example of a woman hitting the wall and making a last-ditch effort to land the alpha while her beta orbiters satisfy her non-sexual needs. This theory says she needs to recalibrate her hypergamous expectations. If you're a Scientologist, your theory says her negative emotional state is caused by destructive engrams. This theory says she needs a good auditing. If you're into critical theory, then you have to view her situations through the lens of power structures and oppression. She's clearly suffering from internalized misogyny, just another casualty of the patriarchy. This theory says she needs to dye her hair and go to a protest. Or maybe you're a back-to-basics kind of guy and your theory says her heart chakra is out of balance. This theory says she should meditate and marinate in essential oils. As for the advice columnist at Slate, it's clear to them that Too Sexy ties her self-worth to her appearance. Their theory says she needs to wield her agency, whatever that means. I could go on, but you get my point. Each of these theories is very clever because each one gives you an answer that fits within its own framework, and there might be a grain of truth in all of them. It's plenty of fun as long as you don't care about accuracy. Do you think you know Miss Sexy Pants any better than you did five minutes ago? I know I don't, but it will be easy to tell myself that I do. I'll stop dancing around it. This kind of thinking is sloppy and undisciplined. Using your brain like that is like using your biceps like this, and I'm as guilty as the next guy. Truth is, we know almost nothing about this person. We know she's having trouble attracting the men she likes. That's it. That's all we know. And we don't even really know that much because people don't always say what they mean. So what we're left with is a gaping hole in our knowledge about this woman, and that's pretty unsatisfying. I don't know about you, but my mind desperately wants to fill in the blanks with a story that makes sense. I want to bring the world into focus and get that cozy little feeling that I know what's going on. But I'm here to tell you, explanations are highly overrated. I've learned to avoid fancy theories and explanations because I've learned how easy it is to be wrong. In my day-to-day -day work with clients, when we're trying to sort out particular problems, I might advance all kinds of ideas. And at this point in my career, I have a reasonably good batting average in certain situations, but I'm still wrong a lot. And the only reason I know when I'm wrong is because my clients are right there to check my math and correct me. I count on that feedback so we don't waste time chasing the wrong answers. I've met me, and I am not to be trusted. If it weren't for those reality checks, I'd be walking around with a stupid grin on my face telling myself how smart I am. You're a goddamn genius! That's the most outstanding answer I've ever heard. You must have a goddamn IQ of 160. You are goddamn gifted. Theoretical frameworks can be unbelievably useful for certain bounded problems. If you're doing geometry, use geometry's theoretical framework. But theories can be fatally misleading in ambiguous, unbounded situations where there's a world of possible explanations. The main defect in any theory is that the set of explanations it can detect is smaller than the set of explanations that might exist. Now you might be saying, back off man, my theory is different. My theory has never let me down. Of course it hasn't. No self-respecting theory is aware of the evidence against itself. In that little list of theories we just applied to Miss Sexy Pants, not a single one has a single element that seeks to disprove itself. Your theory may look infallible, but theories are very good at deceiving us. In fact, once we buy into a theory, it can change the way we perceive the world. That's called theory-ladenness, and it's something of a problem when you're trying to get a clear view of a complex situation. Way back in 1949, there was a wonderful classic experiment by Bruner and Postman that exposed the way theoretical frameworks literally alter our perceptions. It was an elegant experiment on theory-ladenness. They simply showed participants brief images on a screen and asked them to report what they saw. I tell you what. Rather than telling you what Bruner and Postman found, let me reproduce their experiment here as best I can without the original equipment, and you can make your own call. Here's how it works. I will show you five brief images with pauses in between. All you have to do is describe what you see, and we'll take it from there. Ready? Here we go. Okay, most people will have said something like this, or maybe this. In the original experiment, people reported the third and fourth card in different ways. That's because those were trick cards. The third card was a red spade, and the fourth card was a black heart. Those don't exist in a normal deck. 
If you've never seen this experiment before, there's a good chance you've seen thousands of red hearts and black spades, but you've probably never encountered black hearts or red spades. That lifetime of experience creates a theory ladenness that tells you what to expect from playing cards. The trick cards I showed you violate the framework, and that creates a perceptual problem. If you're like most people seeing this for the first time, your brain fixed the problem by changing what you actually saw into something you expected to see. That's what 27 out of the 28 original participants did. Now with practice, those participants became more skilled at recognizing the trick cards, but that was only after the trick was exposed and they had gotten feedback. The problem with clever theories is that they don't provide feedback. We can all look at Miss Too Sexy, and each of us can see what our theoretical framework tells us to see, and we can each walk away feeling 100% correct even if we missed it by a mile. But it gets worse. The more we use our theories, the stronger they become whether or not they've been giving us the right answers. A couple of years after the playing card experiment, Bruner and Postman wrote another paper in which they said, The greater the strength of a hypothesis, the less the amount of appropriate information necessary to confirm it. That might be the most important sentence the two of them ever wrote. They weren't saying a theory is easily correct, they were saying it is easily confirmed. Think back on that expired salmon. If I walk away from a can of salmon because my theory tells me to, then my theory gets reinforced, and it makes no difference if the theory is wrong about that particular can or about salmon in general. I don't go to the hospital, so the theory wins, and the theory gets stronger. Let me show you one more classic experiment that looked at the way theory shapes perception. This one was from 1979. In this experiment, the researchers asked people on two different sides of a contentious political issue to read the same information. If humans were perfectly rational, then looking at identical data would have decreased the polarization of the groups because people on one or both sides of the issue would have adjusted their opinion to fit the data. But that's not what happened. Instead, the subjects adjusted the data to fit their opinion. The groups became more polarized because each side used the information to reinforce their own position and find fault with the opposing side. Now, it's no secret that we think about things in a biased manner. The researchers obviously knew that before the experiment. What they found that was so interesting is that we adjust information to fit our theoretical framework before we start thinking about it, just like the playing card experiment. It's an automatic process, and each time we fail to catch the mistake, we incrementally strengthen our own theoretical framework no matter how ass-backwards it might be. The participants in that study made the automatic error of seeing what they expected to see in the data concerning a political issue that inflamed their passions. Is there any reason to think you couldn't make the same automatic error concerning the character of a woman who inflames your passions? No. If I can convince you of nothing else today, I hope I can convince you that your own theoretical framework can cause you to grievously misread complex situations. That can cause you to keep the right women out of your life and let the wrong women in, and the cost of that error can be devastating. I'm not suggesting you should give up your theories. I'm not even sure how you would do that since we're theory-making machines. You need some sort of framework to guide your behavior around the opposite sex, and an imperfect theory is better than no theory because an imperfect attempt to understand something is better than no attempt at all. The problem is when you use that framework to explain or predict the behavior of any particular person. That can cause catastrophic errors when you're assessing a potential wife or girlfriend. So what's the antidote to clever theories? Well, as far as I can tell, it involves an entirely different way of assessing people. Instead of starting with the certainty that a theory provides, start with the uncertainty of open questions. When I wrote the Tactical Guide to Women, I suggested having standards for the women you allow into your world. It's a process of simply observing behavior and seeing where the patterns emerge rather than trying to predict or explain anything. There are a lot of useful questions you can ask about a woman's character and her values. One of the criteria I suggested was emotional maturity. Her level of maturity or any other aspect of her character is an open-ended question and the answer is not immediately apparent. You have to do the work of collecting the data and being honest about what you see. If you want to get technical, this is inductive rather than deductive thinking. We're starting with a question rather than a range of possible answers. To get the answer, you become an observer in multiple contexts from different points of view over a long period of time. In the example of emotional maturity, that means you watch how she treats her family and her co-workers and how she treats the waitstaff on vacation in Cabo and the employees of the airline that lost her luggage on the way home. You watch her in public and you watch her behind closed doors. You watch her on good days and bad. You listen to how her friends and family speak about her and you listen to how your friends and family speak about her. You listen to the way she speaks about others when they're not around and how she handles conflict. You listen to your intuition, you listen to your intellect, you listen to your inner circle, and you do it all over an extended period of time. You want to look backwards at her actual track record rather than forward at a theoretical prediction. There's no guarantee that her past behavior will predict her future behavior, and there's no guarantee against ugly surprises. Consider something like physical violence. Just because she hasn't been violent in the past doesn't mean she won't be violent in the future. That's one of the blind spots of this approach. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. But tracking her actual behavior is a damn sight more reliable than whatever random guess your average theory can provide. 
This approach takes a lot more patience and effort than the alternative. It's also a lot less fun because it doesn't give you a bunch of bullshit predictions from the outset. But this is your future we're talking about. Maybe it's worth the extra effort. By the way, I didn't invent this approach. This is a really old idea in psychological research. If you're trying to measure something that's difficult to pin down, like whether or not someone is likely to improve your life or to wreck it, you want sufficient data from multiple sources with checks and balances against the mistake your brain will automatically make. Now you might be thinking, why should I trust psychology? Hasn't psychological research had a serious replication problem? Yes, it has, largely because a lot of researchers have veered too far into tightly controlled experiments trying to ferret out tiny little effect sizes of single variables. They've been chasing clever theories. The good news is there's some spirited conversation right now about getting research back on track, and some of the most interesting ideas have to do with this old idea of examining behavior from different angles. Bottom line is you simply can't theorize about people the same way you can theorize about cans of salmon because clever theories give single variable answers to multivariate questions. That's how theories cloud our vision. But over a long enough timeline and with enough information, what you see in a person is pretty much what you get, if you're willing to look beyond your theories and respect the data, no matter what it says. Alright fellas, that's all I got for you today. Take care. You're a goddamn genius!